Are you glad to be in the presence of the Lord? This morning, it's great, great to be uh, worshiping with you today. I uh, just want to say one thing about this song before we revisit it. We introduced this song about seven or eight weeks ago on the first Sunday of June, which was Pentecost Sunday. And uh, this song is really a prayer. I read something this week from an old favorite author of mine many years ago who said, we're not going to change the world by being critical of it or by conforming to it. We're going to change the world when we as God's people walk as combustible agents ignited by the Spirit and the fire of God's presence. That's how we affect change. And so today, this song is simply a prayer. I want you to lift up your heart right now. Will you lift up your hands with me and let's say, Fire, fall on us today. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. Let's sing it. Fire, fire, fall on us. Let's start a new revival. Fire, fall on us. Everybody say fire, fire, fall on us. Let's start a new revival. Fire, fall on us. Like it did. Like it did on the day of Pentecost, rushing in like a mighty wind. Fill us up with your presence and your power, Lord, do it again. We are here crying out in one accord, let the heavens touch the earth. Come and light a passion in our hearts, and Lord, let it burn. Everybody say now. the Lord Jesus would be magnified and glorified in all the earth. Overwhelmed by your glory and your grace, you consume us with your love. Give us more and more of who you are. We can't get enough. Everybody say fire, fire, fall on us. Start a new revival. this. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one place, in one accord. 
and a sound came from heaven like a mighty rushing wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and cloven tongues like fire sat upon each of them and they were all they were all filled with the Holy Ghost Lord like you did it before do it again is our prayer hey just like you did it before Lord we are ready for more just like you did it before Lord we are ready for more say just like you did it before Lord we are ready for more just like just like you did it before Lord we are ready for more just like just like you did it before oh Lord we are ready for the Holy Ghost and we need the fire come on and say I need the Holy Ghost yeah I need the Holy Ghost and fire fill me with the Holy Ghost yeah fill me with the Holy Ghost and fire everybody I need the Holy Ghost in the house this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what happens when we have a fresh visitation, manifestation of the Holy Spirit and fire? We might see miracles. We might see the supernatural. Here's a brand new song that simply says, we need a miracle. Worship as Rachel leads us today. Lord, we confess, we desire, we need a miracle. Hallelujah. You're the same God today. Yes. And the same God tomorrow. Help me see the victory you already see. Let my faith be today. Yes. What it will be tomorrow. When I've seen the victory you already see
Come on, say this by the power of your name. By the power of your name. And all for your glory. The sick are healed. The soul is filled. The battle has been won. On your promise I stand. And in faith I believe it. That what I pray in your name. In the healing, you get the glory. In the healing, you get the glory. In the breaking, you get the glory. In the breaking, you get the glory. In the breakthrough, you get the glory. And in the Hallelujah. breakthrough, you get the glory. Come on and say, in the waiting, you get the glory. above every name you are the God of the impossible you are the miracle maker and those words come straight out of scripture exceeding abundant above what we could ask or think you're standing ready and willing we ask you Lord for fresh wind and fresh fire right now in this room worship as Jenna leads us in this song that simply says we need a fresh wind hallelujah Wow. 
fires fire strengthen what remains listen so we the church bear your light lamp of flame city bright king and kingdom come is what we pray we need a fresh wind the fragrance of Come on, everybody, lift up your voice. Let all the redeemed prophesy and sing. Can you find your own words right now? Lift up your own voice. Lift up your own heart. Cry out to him, Lord. Lord, pour your presence out. Pour your spirit out. Fresh manifestation. Fresh anointing. Forgive us for settling for the status quo. You said you came that we might have life, comma, and that we might have it more abundantly. Help us move beyond the comma to experience life more abundantly. We live and we breathe to worship you this morning. We were created to worship you. We breathe to worship you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's a river flowing from the mountain that shows our God is true. There's a song Rising from the valley, it's our response to you. Cause you are God, God of all creation. The earth groans and longs to be with you. And where you are, our hearts are raised to heaven.
What's the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Sing with us. We stand in awe, faces shine with wonder. Make pure by perfect love. What better way to give you all the honor than to bow? Because you are God, you are God, God of all creation. Be your cross and long to be with you. And where we are, our hearts are raised in heaven. We breathe to us. Calling deep and deeper still The same voice that moved upon the waters Says come drink and have your fill In the stillness I can hear you whisper Still the same voice that moved upon the waters says, Come drink and have your fill. Shout it, says, Come drink.
calling deep and deeper still the same voice that moved upon the waters he's speaking to us right now he says come drink and have your fill in the stillness i can hear you whisper calling deep and deeper still the same voice that moved upon the waters says come drink and have your fill shout it out says come drink That's our cry this morning. That's our cry this morning, Father, that you would fill us, O oh God. Lord, that your presence and your power would just fill us today, O oh God. Lord, breathe upon us, Father. Stir us, O oh God. Father, you know our hearts today, oh God. Lord, we long to be deeper and closer to you, my God. Revive us, oh God. Revive our hearts. Do a work in us, oh God, that only you can do, Father. And Lord, I pray not only for this church, not only for Gastonia first, but God, I pray that your spirit would be moving throughout this city right now. I pray, God, that in every sanctuary where people are worshiping you, God, that your spirit would be moving right now. God, that you'd be breaking chains. God, that you'd be touching lives. Father, that you'd be doing a, a, a work of restoration and revival in the hearts of your people, oh God. Revive your church today, my God. Revive your church and start a revolution for Jesus in Gastonia. Start a revolution for Jesus in Gastonia. God, let it be birthed in our hearts, oh God, that we would take it. Lord, that we would be, as Pastor Derwin said, combustible messengers for you, God, out there in the field, Father, igniting a fire for you, God. Lord, do your work in us today. Lord, as, as we go through this time, oh God, let us hear from you, God. Let your Holy Spirit speak to us in a fresh new way, Father. 
Let your word, God, just be engraved and planted upon our hearts today, Father. Lord, that when we leave here today, God, there will be something different about us. And I thank you for it, Jesus. Lord, for those in this room that need a touch from your hand today, God, a healing touch, Father, we pray, God, that you'll touch and minister to their bodies. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for Belby Price, Lord. God, I thank you for your touch upon him. Continue to minister your healing power to his life today. Lord, for all of those who need a healing touch, Lord, that may be watching this program live on, online, Lord, we just pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would meet them right now, wherever they're at. Lord, that you would be that miracle worker in their life today, Lord, touching them and ministering to them, Lord, as only you can. We thank you for it, God. We give you praise and glory and honor for all that you're doing. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Aren't you thankful you came to church today? Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. And we want to continue this time of worship by giving. And our ushers are coming now to receive those gifts. But this is a time of worship as well. God has blessed us. It's time for us to, to worship him in the giving of what he has blessed us with. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing goodness to our life, Father, and how you have just blessed us abundantly. Lord, as we return just a portion of that to you, God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless those that give. Meet their every need, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would use those gifts, Father, that we would go out and do the work you've called us to do. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for your giving today. I got one quick announcement. It's a big announcement, though, if you'll... Look in your bulletin, and please make sure that you do get a bulletin every week and make sure that you're on top of all the activities that are going on from our church. But you'll notice inside there is a new number for a pastoral care that you can call. And uh, if you've tried to call Pastor Krill or text him and, and he's been ignoring you, it's because he doesn't have that number anymore. We, he's got a new number. Praise the Lord, he's got a new number. Um, but uh, you can call that number and, um, and someone will be able to, uh, to pray with you or, or to meet that need and we do encourage you to use that um, and um, when I'm not available I'm going to be carrying the phone most of the time that number but when I'm not available somebody will have that so there will be a constant 24-7 coverage there so um, just want to, want, you to make, want to make you aware of that Amen. Let's give it up for Pastor Dennis as he comes this morning. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Pastor Creel has a new number written down in glory. Uh, I talked to him this week. They're doing very, very well, just enjoying their family so much, just like, the, just like they had planned and hoped for. And so we're so thankful for that. We've been considering the teaching of Jesus, who masterfully and often taught with stories. Just the simple power of story, the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, the parable of the persistent or the pestering neighbor, the parable of the growing mustard seed, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the parable of the father who received his sons, the parable of the banquet meal, the parable of the forgiven and then the unforgiving servant. And today, we'll turn our attention to a story that Jesus told about treasure. Two stories, actually. The parables about the treasure and the pearl. They're, they're related to each other. The messaging is unified in these two stories. But we're fascinated by treasure, aren't we? Did you ever have a metal detector and just go somewhere and sort of scan, see how many bottle caps you could find? We are fascinated by treasure. 
hidden things, hidden treasure. If, if I were to use the phrase this morning, X marks the spot, we would all have visions of a treasure map scrawled on some kind of parchment showing where the hidden treasure can be found. Hunting for hidden treasure is a theme that has been worked in movies and other popular entertainment. Raiders of the Lost Ark to the National Treasure movies. The idea of searching for hidden treasure really captures our imagination, doesn't it? Hidden treasure. Maybe you've seen the Bugs Bunny cartoon, From Hair to Eternity. It's a cinematic classic. When the wreckage of the Titanic was discovered several years ago, people were trying to get to it to recover any treasure they could find. And they didn't find much by way of actual treasure, but what they were able to bring up did become quite valuable at auction, even if it wasn't valuable at the beginning. There's one shipwreck that yielded some $500 million worth of gold bars. I mean, who wants to go treasure hunting today? <laughs> That's half a billion dollars. Maybe you watch the reality series, The Curse of Oak Island. Anybody watch that show? Yeah, it's not Oak Island, North Carolina. This is the one in Nova Scotia. I've heard there's some things hidden in Oak Island, North Carolina, too. But The buried treasure that might be there, no one really knows what's there. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's Marie Antoinette's jewels. We, we don't know what's there. Some leftover treasure from pirate Captain Kidd, who was a real person. Our imaginations are captured by the idea of hidden treasure, treasure that is buried. And this passage that we're going to look at today in Matthew talks about hidden treasure. So let's go to Matthew in your Bible or on your device. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to read verse 44. This is what Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement or in his joy, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. I love the stories that Jesus begins so directly with the kingdom of heaven is like. Because he's just announcing how important this is in this moment. He's just saying, pay attention, hear this. A lot of times he would actually say, behold, which really just means pay attention, hear this, or, or literally in the Greek, to see this. See it. I'm going to tell you a story, Jesus would say, to help you understand the kingdom better. A man was in his field, or in a field, and he happened to find a treasure. He was in a field and he happened to find a treasure. Now that may seem odd to you to think about treasure being buried in a field, but in the first century, that would not have been unusual at all. They did not have bank accounts or banking institutions in any form like what we have now. There were no safety deposit boxes. There were no safes. We've got a couple of safes in the church office. I mean, you know, there, there, there are tools and utilities that we have now where we can store up things that are precious to us but at that time if you had something precious jewels or money you would place those things often in an earthen jar or like a piece of pottery and you would dig a hole in your yard or somewhere maybe you just go out into some public place or somewhere where there's access the fact is it's secured in your mind because it's hidden so well so you find a spot you make your own map in your mind but you put the valuables in this earthen jar this vessel the valuables the jewels the money and you bury it somewhere that you know where it is and hopefully no one else knows where that is but the law is that whoever owns that field owns whatever is in that field Whoever owns the field owns what's in the field. And so this man, we don't know the details. Jesus didn't give us. But this man was in a field, and he discovered this treasure. Maybe it was just partially unearthed. Maybe he was going to bury something of his own. I don't know, but he discovered this treasure. 
And Jesus said in the story that in his excitement, he saw it and said, hey, hey, he didn't, he didn't just try to take it. He didn't steal it. He said, hey, this is important. This is beautiful. This is valuable. I'm just going to put this right back where it was, and I'm going to buy this field. I'll sell everything that I have. Everything goes on the block because I recognize the value of this treasure that I've discovered here today. He wasn't looking for it, but he found it. He found this treasure. Discovers it in a field that was not his own. It's not a tough decision for the man at this time. I love that Jesus said in his excitement or, or in, in his joy that immediately he knew what his plan of action was. This was going to be worth whatever he had to do to make this happen. Going to make sacrifices. Some of you have made sacrifices in your life to put money aside, to build a deposit, so maybe you can purchase your first home or, or you can, maybe you can buy your first car and not have to borrow the money for it or, 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 or whatever. There, there are things that we prepare for sometimes. This man knew in that moment, in his joy, I've got to have this treasure. I'm going to buy this field. Jesus went on to tell another story that is very similar to this one right in the next two verses. Beginning at verse 45, it says, Again, this is Jesus talking, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Very short story. These two stories, back to back, very short. This man was looking for this treasure. He was searching. This was a pearl business person a pearl merchant he was in the pearl business he knew pearls when he saw pearls he could tell whether they were fake or whether they were real but something this discovery on this day changed his life this discovery on this day presented a pearl to this man that was beyond any pearl he had ever encountered before this was a pearl that was more valuable than any pearl he had ever handled bought or sold this pearl was beyond all of it he's looking for this but he knew immediately that it was worth selling everything that he already had in his inventory it was worth selling his home it was worth selling anything that he had so that he could go and make that pearl his possession pearl of great price changed his life Jesus says that's what the kingdom of heaven is like that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. There is a kind of hiddenness, if you'll let me use that word, kind of a hidden, a hidden quality in the kingdom of heaven. That it's there, it's there in full flood tide. It is, it is the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's real, it's present, it's with us, and its king is alive and working. But it can escape us sometimes. It can escape us. People miss it. It's not always obvious. Now, we've got a room, by and large, that's just full of believers this morning. Maybe it is that, that we're in a room of people who, for the most part, the reason we got up and took a shower this morning and made our way to church was because we, we've encountered the kingdom of heaven at some level. Because we, we've seen it at some level. We're here because we're, we're buying in. But I'm telling you, it is, it is easy to miss until you don't miss it. It's hard to see sometimes until you do see it. It's a work of the Spirit for us to see the kingdom of heaven. You know that these prophets were called seers. S-E-E-R. Why? Because they could see things. They were seers. It's not always obvious. People miss the kingdom of heaven or they don't, they don't hear of it or they are confused about what it is or they think Christians are mean or hypocritical or judgmental. And sometimes they are. Or maybe they've just never really even been exposed to it. Listen, the Apostle Paul missed it. The Apostle Paul missed the kingdom of heaven for much of his life. 
In Acts 9, it records that Paul was breathing threats and murder. That was the description of this man's person and personality. The Apostle Paul was breathing threats and murder, hunting Christians, executing Christians, but he had an encounter with the Lord that interrupted all of the work that he had been doing. This experience on the road to Damascus, you know what Paul did on that day? Paul caught a glimpse of a treasure he was unaware of prior to that moment. And Paul bought the field. You understand what I'm saying? Paul bought the field. He said, what I've discovered here is worth me sacrificing and selling and unprioritizing everything else in my life so that I can now serve this king in this kingdom. And with the same zeal and fervency with which he had attacked the kingdom, all of a sudden he's turned 180 degrees and he's building the kingdom. More than any other single person other than the Lord himself, the Apostle Paul was the builder of the church in the first century. He bought the field. If you read the book of Acts, you find the Apostle Paul giving his testimony personal. Luke records the testimony in Acts 9, but then you find in multiple other places the Apostle Paul, as he's traveling and preaching, he's sharing this story, his testimony of this moment on the road to Damascus. And you know what that moment was? He was saying, this was the moment that I uncovered this jar of treasure in a field. I hadn't seen it before, but I saw it that day, and on that day, something turned inside of me and I decided that I had to have that treasure I had to find that treasure and there was no price too great to pay half of the New Testament has his name on it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Paul said it this way we have this treasure in jars of clay how about that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing Power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested also in our bodies. That's the way the Apostle Paul described it. Why? Because the Apostle Paul found a treasure in a field and decided to sell everything he had so he could buy the field. So he could buy the field. Surpassing greatness. The Amplified Bible says it this way, but we have this precious treasure, the good news about salvation, in unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God, his sufficiency, and not from ourselves. You have your own testimony here today. You have your own Damascus Road experiences. I encourage you to reflect, even in this moment, to reflect, think back to the moment when you first discovered this treasure buried in a field, or this moment where you first discovered this pearl that was beyond any pearl you had found i love that jesus gives these two stories because one shows a seeker and one shows someone that was just interrupted that no matter who you are whether you're searching for spiritual completeness or joy or whether you're just searching for whatever fulfills you today that god can interrupt us where we are and present to us something more precious than we've ever experienced You have your own testimony. Think about how and when it was that you found that treasure or that pearl. Think about your excitement, your joy in that moment. Isaac Watts, the songwriter, wrote these words, when I survey the wondrous cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. The last verse of that song says, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, 
my all. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that when the Lord bids a man to come and follow him, he bids him to come and die. To come and lay it all on the line. Bonhoeffer was himself martyred at the hands of Hitler, no less. That the call is not a trifling, just do the best you can, don't worry about it, skate through, ease through, lackadaisical, take it or leave it, maybe I will, maybe I won't. That's not the call of the gospel. The, the call of the gospel, this treasure that we find, impacts our hearts in such a way that we say, I've, I'm willing to walk away from everything else so that I can have this. That this, the gospel, the good news, we talked about the good news from the book of Romans, students. But the good news, this gospel, that it, it, is, it is so important that I'm making it the priority of my life. I'm making it number one for me. That's what this encounter will do. These stories are, I was telling Pastor Derwin this morning, they're, it, these stories are so much more fun to preach when there's a real cast of characters and there's dialogue and there's all of the, you know, and these, this is one story was one verse, the other story was two verses, three verses total. We got two stories, very little dialogue, very little character development. But the truth is embedded here. Jesus said, This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It asks us. For all of us. Paul said in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the way that I live. Why? Because Paul bought the field. Listen, I want to be very clear. Our invitation, our invitation to come to the kingdom is completely paid for by the sacrificial work of Christ. Our invitation to come, we don't have to muster up for that. We don't have to do good for that. We don't have to do better for that. With that, that is completely paid for by the sacrificial work, by the blood of Christ. Our invitation to the table, our invitation to the kingdom is completely paid for by the blood of Christ. But I will say this, the extent to which we possess the kingdom is really the extent to which the kingdom possesses us. We're not earning our way in. We did not earn that invitation. It was paid for by Christ. But the degree to which we enjoy the kingdom of heaven, and God did intend for us to enjoy his kingdom, kingdom the extent to which we enjoy his kingdom is the extent to which we cooperate with his kingdom it's the extent to which we commit to his kingdom our enjoyment of the kingdom depends on whether we are willing to buy the field or to walk on by and say it's not worth the trouble Just a few weeks ago when we were walking through Hebrews together, we heard these words ringing from Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The writer of Hebrews also said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. There are these warnings over and over that we heard while we were walking through Hebrews together. Well, he was saying, take it seriously. Take it seriously. Make this commitment. Dig deep. Drill down. Listen, we possess the kingdom when we value the kingdom. 
poseemos el reino cuando valoramos el reino. We possess the kingdom when we value the kingdom. I heard Dale Yurton preach a message several years ago talking about how in the 1970s, and some of you will remember this, the 1970s, we, we sort of had this awakening. We, there was this lingo that was used. You saw it on bumper stickers and T-shirts, things. I'm a king's kid. I'm a king's kid. I'm a, I'm a king's kid. I'm a child of the king. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's good theology. That's good. I'm a king's kid. But in that message, I, I looked at Pastor Derwin because Pastor Yurton is a good friend of, of his. But he said, I think it's time that if we're king's kids, that we begin to act like princes and princesses in the kingdom of heaven. That we bear up under the responsibility of leadership that the child of a king would be asked to bear up under. That there's something about buying the field that makes a difference. Remember the rich young ruler? You remember him? Recorded multiple places, Matthew 19. He came to Jesus and he said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to Jesus, Which ones? Which ones? Because this is who we are. This is how, and it's, this, is, we're just, this is how we're built. We're constructed this way. We, we, want, we want the report cards. We want the check boxes. We want to know how we're doing. We want to have the... The, these metrics, these measurables that tell us what our score is. Give me, the, give me the line items and I'll tell you what I've done. And so Jesus begins to give him the line items. You shall not murder, check. You shall not commit adultery, check. You shall not steal, check. You shall not bear false witness, check. You should honor your father and mother, check. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, check. I've done all of these things. He knew something was still missing. Why did he come ask the question? I've done all of these things. All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Was the question that came out of his mouth to Jesus that day. As I'll tell you, most of us, really objectively, on the, on the superficial surface things that can be observed by everyone else, most of us have probably done pretty good. I mean, we're here today, right? Good church-going people. By definition, everyone in this room is a, is a church-going person this morning. Check. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, or listen to it this way, if you would be complete, if you would be complete, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Amazing how some of these things that Jesus, how amazing how unified Jesus teaching, how much Jesus agrees with Jesus. You'll have treasure in heaven. If you want to be complete, if you want to be complete, if you want to be complete, buy the field. Buy the pearl. Figure it out. Make some changes. Buy the field. Pastor Derwin, you can come. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It was too much for him. Couldn't do it. As Jesus is saying, hey, you've done a lot of churchy things, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. He said, you've done a lot of, you've done a lot of churchy things. You, you know how to, you know how to, you know all the lingo but you have not made this a priority in your life. Aren't you glad you didn't skip today? 
You didn't make it a priority. You didn't place it higher in your life. Let me read these passages again. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement or in his joy, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. You buy the field. You buy the pearl. Pastor Dennis, what does that mean? What, how do we apply this? What's the application? Give us, if you could just give us some check boxes, we'd be so thankful because we work real well with that. I will tell you one thing, as, as it is indicated in this passage, it often involves money. It, it often involves money. If you want to find out what your priorities are, look at your bank account. It will define for you, historically, what your priorities have been. And this is not a money raising. We're not taking the offering again. Uh, this is for you. It's not for, not for, for, for the church. It's, God doesn't need your money. He's doing okay. But our money does often reveal our hearts. Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You've seen, you've seen one, you've seen the other. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said a lot of challenging things, didn't he? It's priority. Where does it fall? I know, I, know that, I know that your relationship with God is not your last priority. If it were, you wouldn't be here today. I, I realize that. But God's not asking not to be last. He's asking to be first. It's very different. It's very different. In some places and times here, I've shared some of this from my own life, but I, I don't know that I've ever shared it on a Sunday morning, and I'm going, and if I have, it still applies today, but I remember 1999, Becca and I were married. We had one child. I was working uh, for a company called Shellco Incorporated. Shellco is a, a rapidly growing construction company. Charlotte, very, very connected with all of these, with all of these buildings the banks were building at that time. In fact, at that time we were building the Hearst Tower, 45 stories. It's now the truest building in downtown Charlotte. And I was the IT director for that company and traveled some. Uh, we had offices in Charlotte and Winston-Salem and Raleigh and Greenville, South Carolina. And, and just, it was, it was exciting. It was tough work, but it was exciting work. I was playing trombone, fourth chair trombone at Central Church of God. Many of you know Central. So every Sunday morning, we were in sort of a horseshoe. Trumpets were behind us, just killing us. Nathan, where are you, Nathan? Yeah, Nathan was playing there with me. We were there together. Nathan can vouch for at least this part of the story. But I was fourth, I was the least significant person on that platform, I will tell you. 100 voices in the choir, 30 pieces in the orchestra. I was fourth chair trombone. But for me, I'm sitting here all the way, I'm, I'm right next to this choir. Oh my goodness. It was unbelievable. The music that I was participating in and that I was hearing. And then when that would stop, Pastor Loran Livingston would do what he does. And if you ever heard him, it's hard to explain, but he's gifted. He didn't walk up with an iPad. I can tell you that up. He walked up with his Bible and threw it up on the podium, and then he just went. It was unbelievable. I've told people, and I'll tell you, if you want to hear Loren Livingston-level preaching, you'd better just go to Central Church of God in Charlotte because that's the only place you're going to find that. Unbelievable. Oh, we were so disappointed. If he was ever out of town, we would have these, 
guest speakers' names that you would recognize. Mark Rutland. We'd be so disappointed. Oh, Mark Rutland's here today. Oh, where's Loran? I was, but I'm telling you, the Lord was dealing with my heart. Sitting here. And there's nothing wrong. Hey, there's nothing wrong. Man, thank God for, this is the place that God has some people. It's the right place. Man, I thank God for this, this group. This group sounded phenomenal this morning. My goodness. And they all play better than I did. Uh, but the Lord was calling me to something else. And, and, he was, and I knew he was dealing with me. And I had always been tender toward the Lord. The Lord, I will tell you this, the Lord had never been last place in my life. From the time that I first responded to the, to the, to the call of the gospel, I was seven years old, the Lord had never been last place. The Lord had never been completely forgotten for me. But in that moment... He was not in first place. Because I was, I was happy. I said, Lord, I, I don't want, I like hearing this choir every Sunday morning. I like blowing the trombone. I like hearing Lorraine Livingston preach. And I still do. I was fighting the Lord. I knew I was fighting him. First time in my life I was fighting him and I knew I was fighting him. I knew that I was resisting. And there's probably some people here this morning, you know you're resisting. Or there's somebody watching, you know you're resisting. I was resisting the Lord. And it was a Sunday night service. We had baptismal service, and they had rearranged the, the, the orchestra because the, Baptist, the, the baptistry was underneath the platform, so it was, it was sort of wide and, and narrow, and they could do two at a time, and they were doing it. We, they baptized probably about 100 people that night in that baptismal service, and I'm sitting there, you know, watching, and pretty, pretty satisfied. And at the end of the night, Pastor Livingston called up a family, a man and his wife and his teenage children, high schoolers. And he said, before we leave tonight, I just want us to pray over this family. God's called them to Africa. And they've sold their house. They've pulled their kids out of school. And they're taking their whole family to Africa. And about 15 feet away, I'm over here just under conviction. Feeling it. And if I were to characterize for you what I felt like the Lord was saying to me in that moment... It's just that he was saying, hey, so you're sure you couldn't go to Ohio and lead worship somewhere? Are you sure you couldn't go? Where is it again, Dennis? What, what are our parameters that we're working with? How much are you willing to give? And I let him have it. I let him have it. I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I called my friend, Derwin Ward. Derwin always knew pastors that were looking for worship, guys. <laughs> Went out to visit a church in St. Louis. Pastor Santos spoke, uh, went for a visit with a pastor in Dayton. I don't remember their names. You probably do. Um, Fred and Katrina Willard. Wilson. Wilson. Okay, thank you. St. Louis wasn't the right place. It, I was willing to go. I had given him every. St. Louis wasn't the place. Dayton wasn't the place. Talked to a pastor in Pennsylvania, not the place. And I came back to the Lord. I said, Lord, I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm willing to go. You just have to give me the green light. I don't know. Becca's getting ready to sign another teaching contract for another year with Charlotte Mech. And it was about that time that Pastor Livingston said, we're getting ready to pioneer a church over on the other side, on the west side of Charlotte. We're going to need all kinds of people to help. Central Church at Little Rock. Just fill out the little blue card on the back of your pew and drop it in the offering plate and tell us who you are and what you do and we'll get back with you. And I thought, well, I don't really, I feel like the Lord said drop. And I said, well, I don't really, I, I try not to contact pastors. I let pastors contact me. 
uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to self-promote. You know that false humility, <laughs> which is nothing but pride. And the Lord said to me, again, I'm characterizing, it wasn't audible, but the Lord said to my heart, he said, you mean to tell me you'll get on an airplane, fly to St. Louis and meet with a pastor that's not the right thing. You'll get on a plane and fly to Dayton, Ohio and meet with a pastor not the right thing, but it's too much to fill out a blue card and drop it in the offering plate. It's one of the most incredible experiences of our lives. January 2nd, 2000, was the first Sunday at Central Church at Little Rock. We were there for three years from the beginning. It was really an incredible thing. Ross, you were there with me playing guitar for so many of those years. Nathan also left Central and went over to help. It was incredible. I got a, I got a new job. I got a $10,000 raise. It's been a journey since then. And Lord, I did not know that at that time that I'd ever end up being a lead pastor anywhere or preaching every Sunday morning or anything like that. But I will tell you this, if I hadn't said yes then, I couldn't say yes now. I mean, God has plans for us. He has work for us. He has a place for us in the kingdom. All he wants is for us to buy the field and to say it's worth it. It's worth it. Will you stand? And in this quiet moment, I know the Lord's already been dealing with people. In this quiet moment, I'm going to ask Pastor Derwin to lead us. But if that's you, and you say, I just need to, can I say this? I know we're, I'm starting to push the clock. I realize that. Who was the person that left that treasure in the field? Who was the person that sold the field forgetting the treasure they had placed there? Jesus told us the story of the talents and the one took his talent and went and buried it in a field. Who is that person? Because there might have been a time where we bought the field, we placed treasure, but we have forgotten what it was or where it is. Go dig it up, man. Go dig it up. But if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to come stand or kneel. Just make, a, just make a walking response. There's something powerful about just taking a step. You don't have to, but there's something very powerful about it, I promise, about just taking a step to say, you know what? I don't know what or where or how, but I know this. I know that the place of priority for the kingdom of God in my life has not been where it's supposed to be. And I'm going to step it up. As he leads us, Will you come? I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Come on, you guys. There's more than this. There's more than this. Come on.
Sing it out, sing it out. I surrender. Only you can sing it for you. Only you can sing it for you. We thank you for meeting us in this place, this time. God, thank you for challenging us in such a powerful way with two very short stories that begin with the kingdom of heaven is like. We still hear you telling that story 2,000 years later, and it still pierces our hearts. So, Lord, I thank you for every honest heart that has responded to you this morning to say, I'm buying the field. I'm buying the pearl. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, 14. I love you guys. Go with God. Go buy the field.